Thank you for coming to my Zoom lecture today. I'm Dr. Kathy Kim, and I'm a body function specialist. In my functional medicine practice, I address metabolic and structural imbalances, and my content often focuses on the structural imbalance, but today I wanted to focus more on the inflammatory side of things. I hope you can find some new information that you have not thought about before regarding this topic. I did a search on Amazon, as most of us would do to look for resources. And when you do a search for anti-inflammatory diet on Amazon, just recently I got over 4,000 results for books on this topic. Obviously there is no scarcity in information on this topic of anti-inflammatory diet. And what possibly could I find helpful to you beyond these 4,000 results on Amazon? Obviously, this time of inflammation is on everybody's mind because of COVID-19. This is a great illustration from a, a New England Journal of Medicine article that shows this red bar, which is the amount of inflammation going on in the disease process, correlating to the severity of the illness. So when people are asymptomatic mild up in the first two, to two columns, they have very little infl inflammation going on. And as they get to be moderate to severe, then they have a lot more uh, inflammation. This is an article from way before COVID-19 was on our minds. This is originally from June of 2014, then updated this in November, 2018. And it's talking about anti-inflammatory foods. What does an anti-inflammatory diet do? The immune system, it says, becomes activated when your body recognizes anything that is foreign. And it lists these things and it lists why, what happens to you when you are inflamed day in and day out. And this is linked to a lot of chronic diseases. They packaged it again for August, 2020. So that's 2014, 18, and now 2020, the same exact information. Obviously it's needed out there for people to understand what foods they can do to fight inflammation. I, I found in my work with patients that it, it might be that maybe what to do is not so much the, the information hurdle out there. It's maybe whether or not it applies to you. Uh, obviously there's so much out there about it. What if, what if it, there is so much out there about it, but if you don't believe it applies to you, then you might not take that information in. And I thought that the stumbling hurdle might be for people. What is exactly, what is inflammation? What does it mean to them? And, and are they even susceptible to it themselves? If they don't feel susceptible, then they're not going to be um, receptive to the information. I like this slide because I thought it shows really well how we really, most of us out there are thinking about what inflammation is. Uh, so this is a model of the skin on the surface. I, uh, I circled injury infection. And so that's the damage to this perfect skin. It gets a red bump. It's warm, red, and swollen. This is our traditional view of what inflammation is. And then over here, finally, in this other oval, the skin is healing. We know what that looks like on the outside. This diagram shows what is going on on the inside, under the skin that you can't see at the level of all this molecular biology, all the stuff that is making it possible for that red, swollen, inflamed area on the surface to heal. This, this under the surface part in this diagram is what, uh, is what they're talking about, about why we're inflamed. And so this is what I would seek to explain in this, in this lecture. Inflammation is a response to injury. It's meant to be a temporary way to cope with things when we are injured and we hijack uh, or we kind of change our processes just temporarily so that we can get back on our feet. Like what happens after a flood or a hurricane or a tornado, uh, uh, you, you can cope with businesses being closed and no electricity. You cope with those things, but you uh, expect everything to return to normal. So if inflammation is a response to injury and you don't feel that you're being injured, maybe what we should look at is what could be injuring you or us. This is a impressive slide, impressive to patients when I show them this information about the, 
the cancer in general, which is also an inflammatory condition, but the cause of cancer, because most of us believe that cancer runs in your family, which it does when we see that anecdotally from uh, friends and family, um, but only five to 10% of those are purely genetic. The other 90 to 95% are caused by environment and lifestyle factors. Underneath this uh, this group, then 30 to 35% of that is, is dietary. When you look at this list, the two areas you could do something about uh, that you most could take action on would be under tobacco and the dietary. Hence now this term called the exposome. This was coined in about 2005. It was a little a take on the word chromosome. So this is exposome, the combination of these external environmental factors, including diet, that are affecting your gene expression in your, your chromosome. So it's affecting your gene expression. And then this ultimately impacts your health. So they have lists of the specific external environment in the circle above here, in the bottom level is general external environment. Of course, I'm focusing on diet today. I thought it was kind of helpful to break those two circles down into lists. It's a little easier to see those. And uh, I put under general specific on the right here, we're going to look at diet. As an aside, I thought it's important to note that under consumer products, a lot of the things that we're consuming are actually packaged. And uh, these consumer products they're talking about uh, uh, packaging like health and beauty aids and the packaging, but under diet, you, we also have our package, uh, having packaged things in plastic, wa plastic water bottles, food is, pa is packaged in plastic. And uh, these chemicals are leaching into our diet, but I'm mostly focusing on what's just purely in our food. I thought it was helpful to talk about diet like as if it were medicine. So when I prescribe a medicine, I prescribe the dosage, the frequency, the strength of the medicine. And then there's this fourth component, the toxin additives, the non-food aspects of diet that are really in our food. And to be honest, they're in our medicines also. Many of these medicines have additives to make them bind together. And these are inflammatory actually. And um, same for the coloring that they, that they use to make them attractive and to sell better. Okay, so we'll focus on dosage first. The concept in dosage, I thought that um, patients uh, uh, might not understand well, is that they is they believe that everything they're taking is in moderation, and that is true. I, I do believe they're practicing that, or we all try to practice that. But I think our concept of moderation has been changing rapidly in modern times. I use this glass of orange juice to represent that the glass size for orange juice has steadily increased from the days of your grandmother or great grandmother the days of using elbow grease to juice an orange with the home uh, setup is, are over. Uh, machines can do this very well. And since the ease of obtaining large amounts of orange juice has increased, then of course it's easier to pour more and buy it in larger quantities and the, and the containers have gotten bigger. Uh, it takes three medium sized oranges to make eight ounces of orange juice, uh, but it, I would say most people serving of orange juice is a lot more than eight ounces. And when you're gonna have eight ounces of juice or more with a sandwich, it's probably difficult to eat three oranges, three apples, or in this case, because these are the containers that are the, the larger containers at, a, at the subway, um, these probably represent about five oranges and five apples. So it would be really hard to eat five oranges or five apples with your sandwich but it's much easier to drink the, just the pure juice without the fiber and all the other nutritious parts of the fruit. This lemonade is probably at least 20 ounces and it is not made out of uh, only uh, lemons, it is made out of cane sugar. But the point is, is that when all of these carbohydrates meant to be consumed kind of sort of distributed within the fiber of the fruit is delivered all at once, this is an, in, this is an injury to the body because it's a stress to the body to handle that load all at once. A little bit like what happens when we have too much rain or you try to water a, 
a garden with soil that's really tough, you can pour, put a bunch of water on it, but it's really, um, the soil can only absorb so much at once. And then there are problems when you have way too much water that you can't handle, for instance. Along, uh, so going along the lines of moderation and the idea that is changing, the size has changed now of, of things like artificial, which is was never really natural, of course, to begin with. And so it goes from a 12 ounce can. Now we have a standard 20 ounce bottle. This is pretty standard for what people think is a serving side, size. So 12 ounces is already a hefty load of carbohydrates at once. And now 20 ounces is gonna be that much more. These pictures illustrate kind of where we've come from in terms of the problem of moderation. These are just examples of what they look like thousands of years ago before these were domesticated and uh, altered by our, our own ingenuity. This watermelon, which was, which was full of seeds and not very much fruit. And, uh, and then of course, compared to our modern watermelon and that's true for the banana. It's true for the eggplant, this shocking difference between the original carrot and this juicy sweet carrot we have, and the same for the corn and modern corn. These carrots and corn are, are uh, much more loaded with carbohydrates than, than their ancestors. And, and carrots are one of the sweetest vegetables to uh, consume, even though you're, uh, even though it is good to have as a vegetable. I use a lot of sources uh, from the internet from, it's easy to pick up from the internet because I want you, the viewer, patients to be able to find this information on your own and not feel like you, you can't uh, get a, uh, find it yourself to research it or help your own understanding. Dr. Mark Hyman, he is very uh, visible on Facebook and Instagram. He is the director of fun functional medicine at the Cleveland Clinic where people are coming from all over who have failed conventional medicine and are being given this information about metabolic inflammation and about how to uh, make the choices affect the, the diet that affects their health. And so this information is, is being presented there and he's popularizing it, putting out this information to us. And I'm here uh, helping you understand why it could be relevant to you. Uh, in this one post, he's uh, commenting about a 20 ounce, this HFCS means high fructose corn syrup. So this one 20 ounce soda in a bottle has 17, the equivalent of 17 teaspoons of sugar. And in our ancient ancestry, we only consumed 20 teaspoons in a year. I think I made my point about how the dosage has changed over time. How about the, uh, the looking at the frequency, how this has changed over time? I would say now that no limits exist. Before we were waiting for seasons and we kind of had to wait, but now you know, can fly everything everywhere. And, and even though we're trying to pay attention to the carbon footprint of of fruit shipped from Peru, we still like what we like. In this picture of the grocery store, this is, um, of course, all these little Debbie treats. I grew up on these. Um, they're all the just different forms of the same processed carbohydrate formula of a, a refined grain mixed with some sugar source, something to bind them together, and then uh, different seasonings. And this high fructose corn syrup uh, over here in liquid form. This is to demonstrate that you could really eat a whole day of this food, cereal, pasta, or sandwich, pizza. I should have said cereal, uh, cereal or bagel. Um, you could have a whole day of these foods and think that you had some diversity. But when you break it down by what it came from, they're really all just sources of processed grain and very little of the actual fiber and the nutrition of the fruits and vegetables, the produce that we need. I explain to patients that, that this is kind of like eating Play-Doh. Our food, modern food is a lot like Play-Doh where you take the same Play-Doh and you press it into all these forms and you can set the table in your little dollhouse with bananas and grapes and, um, and uh, uh, hot dogs, and they're really all um, the same food, just pushed, uh, pressed into different shapes and textures. Let's address the potency factor now uh, of things in our diet. 
This one is about how we can see the ingredient list and these are look all natural, but is the quantity actually natural for us? This is partly dosage also, because obviously I was saying that when we drink orange juice, we're drinking the juice of many oranges. When you're having all of those choices, the frequency, you're having all that, the carbs at um, different times of day, and it seems like choices. This potency will address slightly a different area, which is about things you normally would not eat in great quantity at all. This one is about carrageenan, which is a natural ingredient. It naturally occurs in red seaweed. You might recognize this from some seaweed salad in a, a Japanese restaurant, for instance. They found that when it's extracted though and added to, to foods like yogurt, ice cream, you could put in, you could get a really nice, great texture out of it. The problem is, is that the amount that you need to get that texture turns out to be bad for us. It's been associated with getting cancer and stomach problems. This Dr. Tobachman has published many articles about finding that it it's in processed food causing inflammation uh, that of course is related to these chronic diseases. And it's actually so reliable to cause inflammation that she writes that researchers use it to make uh, inflammation happen so they can test their anti-inflammatory drug. It even will cause not, we don't have to just focus on uh, cancer, the apparently mice exposed to this low concentration of carrageenan just for 18 days develop profound glucose intolerance and impaired insulin action, which of course means that they're, they're headed towards diabetes after 18 days of exposure to this carrageenan. What else are we getting in, a, a, in unnatural quantities? This is another post by Dr. Hyman about gluten. Apparently there are a lot of us out there who are genetically unable to uh, process gluten very well, but you take that with the problem that now we've engineered wheat to have much more gluten than even the regular uh, original forms of the wheat that they're having maybe um, domesticated in Europe. This is called, he's calling this super gluten. And this has, this gives the bread even a lighter, fluffier texture that we all love and adore. And he says now it's infected nearly all the wheat in America. Okay, so high fructose corn syrup is also something that you would think is natural because it comes from corn and it's fructose, which is also natural, but it, it's not natural in its concentrated form. And it, interestingly, I, when I looked up about high fructose corn syrup, I, I had always thought that it came from corn that was squeezed a little bit like making orange juice. I thought that it was made out of corn squeezed and you kind of uh, dehydrate it the way you do maple syrup to get the, it dense and sugary. It turns out that it's made out of corn starch that they add chemicals to to reconstitute break bonds and uh, make it into the syrup that they use now to add to, um, to syrup, uh, drinks, uh, food, baked goods. They, apparently it contains a lot of mercury. So this FDA researcher requested a barrel of this and she ran it through the chemical analyzer and it had toxic levels of mercury because of the manufacturing. And it had these other chemical peaks that she couldn't identify uh, what those were. Moving on to other non-food items that would affect us in our diet that could cause us injury, non-food toxin additives. This was an impressive post. This came a few uh, months ago that glyphosate, which you might know as Roundup, I've seen commercials about, do you want to participate in a class action lawsuit about Roundup if you've used it as weed killer? The problem is, is all of us would have to jump on that lawsuit because it is used all over the world for these food crops, especially on our grains, uh, wheat, corn, and soybeans, which is used as the feed for the animals. You can tell where I'm going with that is that now it's in the feed, it goes, the animal eats it, now it's in their flesh, and then you're eating glyphosate in the, in when you eat uh, meat that's uh, been fed this, these crops. It's amazing that a bowl of Cheerios has more Roundup per serving than vitamins D or B12. And that is an impressive comparison that brings it uh, to the forefront of why 
why uh, we are all getting injured by these non-food additives in our diet, toxins and additives. He makes another post about the top 10 foods with the most, uh, with the most pesticides. I find it helpful. I suggest to patients that they make a list of this because it's really hard to commit to memory. When you're faced with the special at the grocery store, it's really hard to remember what that list, what was on that list. Here's a picture of when you would be in a produce uh, section of the store and you're overwhelmed with how pretty and natural everything is. But now you have to temper that with the knowledge that there is a concept of the 10 foods with the most pesticides. There's another list out there called the Dirty Dozen. That Dirty Dozen list changes every year, but not by much. It's mostly the same. And these are the produce items that have the heaviest doses of pesticide applied. And when I say heaviest, I don't mean that they have one. I mean, if you looked at the what was on them, they have several pesticides at once. These pesticides, because they're meant to kill the bugs, they have some neurotoxin ability. So if you ingest those and they accumulate in your body, then this might affect your, your thinking or your nerve function, brain or other, other nerve function. But they also have other properties as well. They, they can stimulate enzymes for susceptible people. They can stimulate enzymes to make you make fat. Uh, and they also can make you more resistant to, to uh, your insulin, same as that carrageenan. And this is how someone could be religiously be a diabetic and eating salad really diligently, or someone trying to lose weight and eating salad diligently and not finding that they're losing weight because these pesticides would actually be preventing them from losing weight. My, my experiences in, uh, when I take them to the grocery store or shopping are definitely more heightened than yours would be because I see patients who are affected by this. One of my patients had not lost a pound in 13 years of trying. And when I introduced her to these uh, concepts and the idea that it's not her fault if her body's enzymes are provoked into making fat when she eats certain pesticides, she ate clean. And when she ate clean, she lost 35 pounds over a year, but she had limited funds. So whenever her diet would get quote unquote dirty for a short period of time, her weight loss would plateau. Here's another additive toxin that, that we're exposed to. And these are the artificial colors. This, uh, no, uh, the main one I wanted to point out is red dye 40. They, although he points out that there are 3,000 food additives on the market, uh, I'm sure I know the name of only a handful. And the average one of us is eating five pounds of this additive a year. I explained to patients that these artificial colors are made out of petroleum, which we all understand is what we use to make gasoline and oil. And so it's clearly not a food, it's a, a fossil fuel or, uh, and but it can be processed into something that we can use to make pills look more attractive, like um, uh, like prescription pills, but it's also in uh, NyQuil and Pepto-Bismol or over-the-counter medicines. I believe it's in Theraflu. Then there's, um, it's in the red velvet cake and those beautiful frostings that we that we like to decorate with. Okay, now we can regroup a little that Injury is prompting a crisis repair. And this crisis repair is what inflammation is. What was happening under the surface of the skin of the red inflamed bump, the injury is what's pro provoking this. Hopefully now you could feel somewhat open to the idea that you might be getting chronically injured by, uh, by your food of all things, uh, mostly what's added to the food or how man has changed our our food through ag uh, agriculture and made it sweeter in general, sweeter mostly and bigger. And this chronic injury leads to chronic inflammation and this chronic inflammation, this chronic 911, we're only gonna get through this for a little while. This chronic inflammation is what uh, creates the environment uh, that activates disease. Again, to drive home the, uh, the idea that it's a response to injury meant to be only temporary. Okay. If it were that simple, now we can understand that we, sh we maybe believe that we are inflamed, that we don't have to look in the mirror and think, I look inflamed. We actually believe that under the uh, surface of our skin, we are inflamed because there are things injuring us. 
why wouldn't everyone who actually understands this concept follow an anti-inflammatory diet? Based again on my experience with working with patients, I feel it falls into two main categories, beliefs and behavior. And this is for the people who, who could see that, but they still can't change. There are many people who, who understand that or have learned that, and then they change. Sometimes it's only in response to when they get sick, but, uh, but they do change. This belief is the erroneous kind of beliefs. I think it goes under knowledge deficits or knowledge deficits is what's uh, causing these erroneous beliefs. I call them erroneous popular beliefs that I'm doing okay because I'm doing everything in moderation. We talked about that so far already about how fossil fuel and mechanization make supernatural quantities available in terms of the quantity of juice, the frequency of baked goods, the frequency of snacks, how much we can consume in uh, products like uh, dairy products and livestock, because some of these things take a long time to make, but, uh, but if um, there are huge factories putting out large quantities, we can have it whenever we want. Genetic engineering has made it so that what is a moderate amount of gluten to have, that has changed drastically. Also, what is a moderate amount of fruit? The size of the fruit has changed a lot. What is the moderate amount of chemicals? When you understand there are 3,000 food additives, mercury in the high fructose corn syrup, these additives, some of them natural, but in supernatural quantities, other ones are clearly non-food. What is a moderate amount of these? And another belief is that exposure to chemicals makes your body stronger. That is a joke often thrown around, but maybe deep down it reflects a little belief in there also. Uh, I want to clarify that people might be confusing immunity to bacteria and viruses, which is part of the natural world with toxins, which are from the man-made world. Bacteria and viruses have a lifespan, span, lifespan and body battles them constantly. These are, we are living organisms locked in a life or death fight and these stimulate the immune system. But toxins that are man-made are accumulated in the body and ultimately weaken the immune system. Some of these pesticides or additives, a lot of these pesticides um, and chemicals, they enter your body and some you might get rid of in a few days. Other ones take weeks, months, and a few of them uh, don't leave you for years. Every time you have them, you're keeping that for a few years. And then we come to behavior. Why are we having a hard time? Even if we know that this is not good for us, we can't change our beliefs or we're, we don't know enough knowledge to change our beliefs know enough information to change our beliefs or do we are controlled by our cravings, habits, and desires so that we can't change our behavior. About 95% of all that we think and feel and learn, these are all happening without our being aware. And that is where our behavior, our hitch is happening on, on changing our behavior. And this is also capitalized upon by marketers because a lot of the products that we're talking about that, that, that we're consuming need to be sold to us. We have to feel that we need them and want them. This, this field in the 20th century is a field called neuromarketing and it was pretty much started around 1929. Edward Bernays is the, was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And he read his uncle's uh, writings and he thought that he could use that information about the unconscious mind uh, to help market goods that he was using in his work. He even had written a book about propaganda and he thought, well, these concepts didn't have to be just used for the government. You could use them for marketing. Here's, there are many examples of his kind of approach to advertising, but here is one of them uh, that he was approached to increase the market of women smokers. He recognized there was an unconscious desire that women wanted to have male power. They thought cigarettes symbolized this. Well, there were women smoking then, but it was more of a taboo thing to do in public. So his solution was to have Lucky Strike make a campaign called the Torches of Freedom campaign. And this changed smoking's image from sexual promiscuity to one of power and independence. I did read uh, as an aside that his own wife was smoking and he understood that it was bad for her health. So he was trying to 
convince her to stop smoking while he was working on this ad campaign. This is a very famous example of his use of his uh, his uncle's theory that he had to he was asked to increase the market for bacon. The problem was in this post depression era, everybody was really habitually leaning on black coffee and toast. He recognized there was an unconscious desire to be healthy. So what he did was he surveyed doctors and asked them, do you recommend to your patients a light breakfast or a hearty breakfast? And of course, most of them suggested a hearty breakfast. And then this is how the hearty bacon and eggs American breakfast was born. Uh, I should note that, of course, this idea of having a hearty breakfast is now we're um, understanding that fasting is better, intermittent fasting is better. And so I want to make sure people understand that just because this is a cultural um, truth about America, that we don't have to stick with the hearty American breakfast. How has this changed now for the 21st, uh, 21st century? Now marketers can use EEG, the tracings of the brainwave activity to uh, on people focus groups when they show them their product or have them consume their product to understand what parts of the brain get stimulated. On, they can detect the guilt center of the brain. They can detect what parts um, uh, light up for memory and motion. Motion, for instance, to be excited to go out and buy the product. They can also wire you up to machines to measure if your sweating increases, if you get goosebumps, if your heart rate goes up and how fast your eyes are moving back and forth. These are examples of how they can use this. So this is ways to appeal to your unconscious mind, to your brain activity, uh, what you're not aware of to help direct what they want you to do or want you to respond to. Frito-Lay focus groups found that the matte beige bags that had potatoes and healthy ingredients on them did not trigger the guilt area of the brain, unlike just their shiny bags with just straight pictures of chips. Uh, and they're not going to pay for this information and do nothing. They, of course, changed their packaging. And Cheetos found out that consumers love that sticky orange dust that gets all over. They People... Uh, this lights up a certain section of their brain that shows that they that they love this um, this texture. So how does produce? We'll take out the for the moment that this has been genetically engineered to be bigger and greener and hardier than the ancestors. But how can plain produce now compete with these packaged? Uh, targeted, engineered products geared towards what we can't resist. I'm hoping that's what you're thinking because I'm here to suggest what you can do to be uh, to help yourself become more savvy about what is going on out there in terms of your behavior. I suggest that we all need to work on being more mindful, more aware. So let's be more mindfully aware of, of things that are going on, like what's natural. Be aware of your belief system, because if you're aware of these things, then it's harder to be manipulated by them because you're just responding to what, uh, what your emotions and as we, as we uh, saw your subconscious is uh, telling you. I put this slide here uh, of nature and fire to remind us of a couple things. When we're in the natural world a lot more, interacting with it, within it, living with it, adjusting our consumption based on how much it rains because our water comes from the rainwater we collect or uh, firewood because this is what we can have when the trees die naturally in the, in the woods and we don't fell any trees then we're more in touch with the, with the ebb and flow and the, the uh, tying in of supply and demand. But when we, uh, when we live in an era where everything that we do is subject to a switch on and off, we can actually mistakenly believe that things in our own body um, work that way also. They just turn on and off. 
they don't um, have like a tail on it. For instance, a fire, when it goes out, we all understand that you douse it with some water and it's the wood is going to stay hot for quite a while. It's going to take a long time for those embers to die out. When you have a flood and the water recedes, Hurricane Katrina, for instance, the mud is there for a long time, takes a long time to dry out. This is what's happening when we eat and consume these uh, substances and foods that are injuring us. We can eat this inflammatory injuring food yesterday and think that we're all cured and good the next day when we eat our salad. But the tail on that, like the, uh, the heat of the fire, takes a long time to die down and we do not function our bodies like these switches. I propose then that we should name this diet an anti-injury diet, because I think that would help everybody kind of remember what it's for. If you can't remember that inflammation uh, means that it's you're disrupted underneath the surface of the skin, at least it's a little more clear. So how, what would you do on an anti-injury diet? Well, you try to avoid getting injured. You would want to avoid high dosages of things that are inflammatory, which are in unnatural amounts or frequency or strengths. And you also would try to avoid these toxin additives, which are sometimes natural and sometimes very, uh, very synthetic. And you would try to prevent injury. This is where everyone, those other resources were focusing on helping you understand about eating anti-inflammatory foods, the cabbage family, this darkly pigmented produce. These are the ways that you could prevent injury. The important thing to understand about preventing injury is that you, you have to do it in proportion. I liken it to using Scotch guard on your suede shoes or boots. You're going to do that and put the Scotch guard on to help it be resistant in the case of splashing or a little bit of rain. But if you're going to go walk in two feet of water with those with those scotch guarded boots, uh, I, I would propose that that's really not going to protect those shoes for long. I put this list together of common conditions because most everyone, if they don't already have it themselves, has someone that they know or family member who has these conditions in many different organ systems of the body, heart disease, high cholesterol, psoriasis, diabetes, the hypothyroidism, obesity, these are inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, dementia, Parkinson's, cancer, asthma, and rheumatoid arthritis. So we, I took a little sample of all of these. And of these, I wanted to point out that which one of these are caused by chronic inflammation? And it, the answer is they all are. Some people will um, get uh, have this problem with chronic inflammation, and then they will get these when they're 20 or really young, 30, or some won't get it till they're 70. That all depends on the exposome, the diagram here, where these external environmental factors have to act on your genes, turn on genes, gene expression, the combination of that and who, who is susceptible to which things that's so individual. And that's why you can have people who have this problem starting very young and some who don't have it till they're older. And we're not sophisticated enough to be like, oh, you're going to have it young. You're going to have it old, maybe one day. So I wanted to help you understand that the resources are out there for, for you to find something, a plan that you could stick with about how to reduce the injury that's happening in your, in your lifestyle, in the area that you can do the most, uh, the biggest uh, something about, which is of course in the diet. And I think that it would help if you could practice informed moderation and my lecture was aimed at helping you on that path so that whatever road that you're on for healing, however fast you're traveling on it, that this could help you even more. This is a very helpful slide. This is from an Instagram post by Dr. Hyman. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health and treated by the health industry, which, which I'd like to say, which up to now pays no attention to food but 
it is definitely a different time now with the Institute of Functional Medicine and the Cleveland Clinic committing to having a uh, center there. And so I would say, which are treated by the health industry, which up to now pays no attention to food, has paid no attention to food. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope if you have any comments or uh, questions, you can uh, put them in the comment section when it's posted on YouTube. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.